Well, thank you again for eating your food that fast and being back here for what is, I think, going to be a real treat of a conversation. You know, we often have these controversies about the censor board and certification of films, and I've been thinking it really doesn't matter actually because they are out of the hundreds of films that are made every year in India, the censor board shouldn't look at any of it. And when they give that UA, I think what it really means is underage, you know, <laughs> that almost all cinema made in India is for nursery uh, grade children. And we often say that you have to leave your brains behind to go and enjoy a film. <clears throat> and then in that year, there are a couple, maybe just a couple or three, that are ever made which accepts that this society may be, just may be comprised of an adult mind. And the practitioners of those two or three films a year that speak to our adult minds are represented by very, very, very tiny group of people. We've been celebrating some of them in algebra and today we have perhaps one of the most delightful, outspoken, blunt, talented artists, you know, blessed of that tiny community of people that holds India to its more adult mind. <laughs> of course, Ratna Pathak Shah is not on screen as often as we should see her on screen, but she has kept the theater movement alive in, in India. And the last couple of films that she has made has really raised the bar for what can pass for cinema in India. Most recently, Lipstick Under My Burqa, and the absolutely stunning performance of Usha Parmar, which I hope all of you have seen. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the outspoken, blunt, very, very hyper-talented, Ratna Patak Shah. Thank you. Ratna, I hope you're going to treat us to your biting tongue. Outspoken, so, blunt, what else was it? I said hyper-talented. Hyper-talented. I was just putting all my which, caveats which in one, Which one should I start with? <laughs> Outspoken or blunt? Which adjective do you want her to live out? <laughs> Actually, I'm going to hold you to the hyper-talent. Maybe you can do some cameos from uh, Usha Parmar before you get off the stage. <laughs> no, no, I get paid big money for that. <laughs> no freebies here. <laughs> Well, Radna, let's start with the moot point, you know, as I was saying, this adult mind. In your opinion, I just shared mine. Is Bollywood an uh, uh, industry that serves an adult mind? No prizes for guessing the answer to this question. No, it isn't. It's an industry that is interested in making money. And that is its one point agenda, making money. Everything boils down to that, unfortunately. We haven't yet got past that absolutely basic impulse. And therefore, I don't consider it an adult industry at all, in any form, either in terms of content or in terms of form. We are not yet done with pandering to the lowest possible common denominator. So I'm afraid we are still very, very um, kacha. Well, I'm going to uh, come back to what you, what you define as the absence of an adult mind, but I just want to call you out on one thing that isn't making money a, a legitimate enterprise. You just said you're not going to do any freebies for no money, you know, isn't, isn't. <laughs> she caught me out. Good one. Yeah, but today I'm not here in the business of making art. I'm not here in the business of um, communicating defined ideas. I'm here to have a conversation. This is not my uh, work profile. You've called me here because you think I have something to say that you want to hear. But this is not what I do for a living. I don't talk in public uh, arena for a living. So I don't expect money for this. I don't expect. Um, uh, to be uh, compensated in any way except to have a, an interesting evening out. <laughs> Whereas, when I'm in the business of making a movie, that's my work. And I expect to do something that is of use to the audience that is seeing me. 
I don't imagine that the audience wants to be instructed at all possible times about the grimness of life and the difficulties of taking decisions and the choices that we have to make every day, et cetera, et cetera. We are doing that in life in any case. But I do expect art to record the times as they are and to in some way make these times more accessible to us. I don't know, I don't know about you guys, but I just find everyday living so hard. You know, there are contests, there are conflicts, there's churning at every step of the way. Whether I'm dealing with my kids or I'm dealing with my work situation, I'm dealing with my maid, I'm dealing with the bhajiwala, whatever it is, conflict seems to be the key to more or less my entire life. I just desperately need to make some sense of it. I need to see the large picture. I need to push myself out of my immediate context and look at it from a point of view that helps me see the individual components in a way that I can make sense of. I, I think art is extraordinarily important to me. Beauty of any kind, the creation of beauty is to me the one singular unusual aspect of the human species that truly defines us. We are able to imagine and therefore create beauty in the way we dress, in the way I cut my hair, in the way I speak, in the way I listen to music. I am able to be a recipient of and a creator of beauty. And that sets me apart from, as a species, it sets me apart from almost everyone else. And I really feel that that's a very special position that I seem to occupy in the hierarchy of things. And I'd be a damn fool not to make the best of that. Well said, Ratna. Um, you know, I asked you about this, uh, and you said Bollywood is not an adult place. Two questions. Is Indian society, does it have an adult mind? Do you think we have an adult mind that Bollywood is not addressing? And secondly, how does this absence of adultness manifest itself in Bollywood? Can you quickly list the crimes? I think the absence of adultness exists in the minds of the directors and producers. I don't think it exists in the minds of the audience. The audience has been to blame for years and years. We've been dumping our own inefficiencies at the foot of the audience's door. I am damned if I'm going to perpetrate that. It's not the audience. So, you know, give yourselves a pat on the back if you want to. But I will come to you in a little bit. <laughs> Let me first address my end of the argument. And no doubt we are guilty of not willing to put in the kind of work that is required for any creation of any kind. When I cook a meal, I put in effort. I cut, chop, decide, put together a piece of something that I can put out in front of everyone. It's effort. It's thought. It's not money that is motivating me entirely. Whereas when I am somehow in this area of art that I seem to be part of, that means I'm talking essentially uh, the acting profession, I just find that, you know, they don't expect anything of me. They want me to be a complete dumb cluck. Why? I don't understand. And they expect everyone to be a complete dumb cluck. Why? I mean, that has to do with the fact I'm convinced that the producer, the writer, and the director have not pushed the envelope. And I've been on the inside for long enough to know that it is a fact. We are not willing to put in the effort that is required to push the envelope. We will not put our money where our mouth is. We will pay 20,000 rupees to get a cup of hot chocolate that the actress wants, but we will pay our writers peanuts. That stinks, as far as I'm concerned. You cannot get good work out in the op open without the mind that is required to articulate it. I have ideas. I don't know how to put them out there yet. Somebody knows. 
that somebody must be given an opportunity to do that, no? In Hollywood, there's a huge amount of money set out for development fund. That you give a script to t the time to germinate. You bring it minds. You think about it. You work at it. You don't just go on the set and write a scene while you're waiting for the hero to finish his makeup. You don't do it like that. The world over, it's not done like that. And some, to some extent, in India also, it's not done like that anymore. In some contexts, yes. But for too long, we have done it. And we have cheated the audience. And the audience has happily been cheated. So who am I to blame? Anyone? Well, you were going to come back and slam bang the audience. You haven't done that yet. I'll give you opportunity later. <laughs> but before that, uh, when, when you've been critical of the creative landscape in which you find yourself, I found it intriguing that you picked two, which I would like you to elaborate on, where you said when you were looking at world cinema, the only thing that happened was, okay, Satyajit Ray was tolerable enough that you didn't have to hang your head in shame. And you also listed Shole as one of the all-time disasters in terms of stereotypes, you know. Now, those are two difficult questions that would you bear them out today that you think Satyajit Ray was only just tolerable, why? And why do you think Shole also doesn't make the cut for good cinema? Boy, I'm going to get into trouble. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, well, Satyajit Ray, I have to say I saw Agantuk recently. And um, it was a film I must have seen when I was in college. I know there was a Satyajit Ray festival happening in Bombay at the Akashwani Theater when I was in my first year of college. So of course I volunteered because that was a way to get a free ticket to watch all the shows. So I was there and I tried to sell a copy of the brochure to Mr. Ray as he walked up the stairs. <laughs> so I remember feeling particularly mortified. And um, though I have to say I've really deeply loved some of Ray's movies. But a film like Agantuk, I was shocked by the shabbiness of it. And, you know, people would be willing to lynch me for saying this, because somehow we need to venerate somebody who's good. We need to make that into a completely unquestionable cult. cult. You know, somebody who we have to genuflect to. And that's a horrible way to be in the arts. I don't know if it works anywhere else in the world, but I know for a fact that in the arts, it's of no use to man or beast, you know? I mean, why would you want to genuflect? The whole business of art, the whole business of drama and film is a constant question and answer process, a constant discussion that you're setting up with yourself. Yeah, yeah. Why would you want to accept one complete answer? It, it would be the death knell of any person's creative journey, to me at least. So, to, for me, Mr. Ray is truly exceptional because at a time when nobody was making movies of that kind, he made movies that I'm really happy to see even today. You know, Pathir Panchali, I watch it and it's, it transports you even today, so many years after it was made. I can't say the same about, uh, what, Devi, even, quite honestly. I love Pratitundi, but I can't say the same about several of his other plays, uh, films. So I want the right to discuss and analyze and work my way around a person's offering. And I expect that everyone would do the same for my work. Only then will I move to the next level. But we don't want to have any discussion. You know, there are no reviews in theater. Bombay does not have a single newspaper that prints a theater review. Not a single. There are online forum, fora, which print theatre reviews. But not a single major newspaper in Mumbai prints a theatre review. How do I know what I'm doing is right? You know, criticism is a very huge pillar for my community. I get nothing. I get adoration or I get brickbats. What use are either to me? You know, I, I, this is the big danger I'm seeing in Indian mindset. Either we like to adore or we like to lambast. But there's a huge ground in between. More useful, more valuable. We need to be in that ground there. You know, and in the arts, I desperately need to hear 
voices which tell me what I'm doing is right and what's not working. And fortunately, the internet has opened a little window there. You, you got off the Shole question. Shole? Oh, man. What a complete set of chori that film is. Sorry. 100% frame by frame copies of films. I can give you a list this long. Music is copied. Shots are copied. Story is copied. Sorry. You can't get me terribly and interested in a... Yeah, okay. So a lot of these, most of India didn't see Once Upon a Time in the West. So yeah, they get very excited when that swing goes and the mm, that tune happens. Everyone gets their knickers in a twist about it. I've seen it before, sorry. So you're not going to get me excited about it. So now that we've got a dose of what you criticize, uh, Ratna, I'm going to come back to ask you for positive uh, examples of what you consider art or of thoughtful art or of really creative edge. But before that, I want to just come to this role you played in uh, Lipstick Under the Burqa uh, and the role of Usha Parmar. You know, did you enjoy it? Did you feel squeamish? Did you hesitate about taking on the role? And what was the most difficult part of playing a masturbating middle-aged woman in a set where there would have been men, cameramen. Can you just share with us a little bit about that? Did you find an adult mind on set? Absolutely, 100%. Alang Preta was 100% responsible for it. She held workshops with the, with the crew, not just with the actors. Of course, we worked, we read the script, we workshopped together before we went on. So we did have to get past the initial discomfort of doing scenes like that. And I didn't have a straight out sexual encounter in the film. But Coco did, Konkona did, and so did Ahana. And it was difficult because they were shooting on location. They were shooting on an open set. So there are these issues. But I tell you, anyone who says that Indian men are lascivious SOBs should have been on my set there. Because there was a bunch of guys, all of them. And I've seen people on a set and they can be really, really ugly, particularly in this matter. The kind of jokes that happen, the kind of bitching that happens around the monitor, it's not pleasant. Somehow, we Indians just love to display the really ugly side of us all the time. And on a film set, it comes out in droves for some reason, I don't know why. <laughs> but really, this was an extraordinary set because it, it, I felt so completely safe. And to answer the other questions, yes, I was squeamish. I was not sure of how these scenes are going to work out. I have seen enough uh, examples of sex being treated lasciviously in Hindi cinema. Uh, it's not an adult view of sex. And that did worry me. Is this film going to be a similar experience? It wasn't, which is a great relief. Uh, there was a discussion between me and Alankrita on the tone of the, um, of the voiceover, since I had to do the voiceover as well. And I did feel that at some points we were unnecessarily going towards something uh, provocative when it wasn't required. I I'm all for provocation if it's going to end up in something really valuable. But provocation, just because of provocation, just because you want to get a rise out, of it's a waste of time for me. And it dilutes the real question. So I was happy that we managed to find common ground, Alankrita and I. And that's true of all the other actors, because all of us had our moments with Alankrita. And she handled it really with a great deal of maturity. And the fact that a script like that was written for four women, and they came to us. They didn't go to Madhuri Dikshit, you know. Hallelujah. <laughs> it was the most extraordinary experience that a script like this was written, an actress like me was approached, I would have been an idiot to say no. So of course I said yes, immediately. And so did finally enacting that, was it a liberating experience for you as well? You, you've done it with such a kind of naughty joyousness, you know. Did I was you... actually surprised by the humor of the whole film. You know, with, with a subject like marital rape, it's hard to find humor there. But somehow, Alangrita walked that line quite beautifully, I thought. And there was, I, I am convinced that humor is, 
is what helps us to get to the next level, you know, to deal with the unpalatable, to deal with the really uncomfortable. So much of life is so uncomfortable and unpleasant. Humor can make the whole process easier. And Alankrita, I thought, used it extremely well in lipstick. So uh, just to cycle back, Ratna, to my earlier question that having critiqued uh, Bollywood and what it serves up, what is your landscape of you know, art which you respect or which has moved you or transformed you? So is there a list of maybe six or ten films that you would say are Ratna Patak's list of movies to see before you die? <laughs> oh yeah, lots, lots. And uh, what I find hopeful in a small way, I suppose, because one has been here, seen this before, the 70s was this lovely moment when everyone thought we were going to change the world. We were all out of college and, you know, professional institutes, guys coming out of the film institute, guys coming out of the NSD. We thought we were going to really do something magnificent. Didn't happen. Um, I've always believed that a filmmaker is as good as his second film. The first film is a breeze to make. Anyone can make a good first film. Like, I guess anyone can write a good first novel. I don't know. I'm not a writer, so I wouldn't be able to say that for sure. But do you, do you think Nasir's first film was a good film? Uh, the one he made directorially? Well, I would say that it was an incomplete and uneven project. It certainly was not what he imagined. Since I was there uh, through the ideation also, I know that this is not what he had imagined. But the fact is, he didn't get it right. Okay. Bottom line is that. So whatever the reasons for it may be, he didn't get it right. And he seems to have got scared off. He says he's never going to make another film. I hope he changes his mind. Because I think he needs to put that to rest. But so having first, said that... First films are not always... Uh, not always off. good. But, you know, it's easier to make one good film in a lifetime. But to make good films relentlessly, sustainably, that's where the problem comes. How do you keep doing it again and again? How do you want to uh, capture uh, the human experience over and over again so that you can talk to an audience? You don't have to talk to everyone. I'm happy to accept that every film doesn't have to get across to everyone. It's not possible. I mean, I'm not the same person as a person who goes to watch uh, a Salman Khan film. I'm not. My life experiences are different. and I. I cannot imagine that the same film will satisfy both of us. <laughs> Talk about a topsy-turvy world. I hope you all know that Salman Khan has just been awarded uh, the global ambassador. No, he's just been awarded an honor award for creating global diversity, whatever that means. You know, <laughs> by uh, since we have got film fair awards for the guy with the best mustache and the girl with the best lehenga. I don't see why you couldn't give Salman Khan an award for something or the other. But I have to say, one of my recurring nightmares is that the world has come to an end and all that survives of our entire civilization, north, south, east, west, is a copy of Dabang. <laughs> I wake up in cold sweat thinking of that sometimes. Well, in an earlier time, You've evoked the same metaphor of disaster and the last thing left of us was Shole. And it gave you the same cold sweat. You know? Yeah, but Shole is infinitely better than Dabang. <laughs> I mean, we are hitting. We are going far. <laughs> Does that give you hope that we are sliding to the bottom? Well, if we hit bottom, then we'll have to rise now. <laughs> so, inshallah, we'll do that also. <laughs> okay, but to come back to your list, Ratna, so if, would you name yes. some films or directors that abroad or here? Yes, yes, all over the world. Exciting times all around. Because suddenly, filmmaking has become so accessible. I can make a film with a video ca I mean, my mobile phone. That gentleman there has got a mobile phone going throughout the evening. And, you know, I mean, he can edit it and create a little story out of it if he so chooses to. But hopefully he won't. <laughs> <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is that um, democracy has hit art in all kinds of ways, I have to say. I mean, I'm not sure of the point I'm trying to make. It's, it's a point I'm trying to work my own way around. But I do feel that if 
anyone can create art, then what will be our definition of art? What will be our benchmarks? And who will establish those? Facebook? Twitter? Who will establish the benchmarks of what a society thinks is good art? Who will help us articulate? Who will help us separate the wheat from the chaff? Because that's part of it. Everyone wants to create something. I would love to be able to sing you a song just now, but you don't want to hear it because I'm not a good singer. But somebody has to tell me to shut up, no? So who's got going to be that person who will tell me to shut up? That is going to be the big issue with demo the democratization of art. Uh, Cinema, which has so far been an expensive medium, and therefore in the grip of a few, suddenly has opened you know, up. Yeah, but, but give me out. your list. Give me your list, because I'm planning to run home tonight and watch what you like. So give yes. us a list. So having said that, of course, there's all kinds of stuff happening on online. You've got ten-minute films. You've got three-minute films. You've got five-second films. Except all interesting. In, well, not all, but some definitely. But so therefore, if one is to uh, sift, then where would one start? Start, I, with, I, start with cinema scope, since we are criticizing Bollywood. Hmm. Start with full blown 70 mm, whatever, that, that level of cinema. Wow. Who do you like? Um, you know, I never saw that kind of cinema too much uh, because my parents were not terribly interested in film goers. My dad, of course, was snooty and he wouldn't let us watch any Hindi movies because Hindi movies were low grade. Etc. So we watched a couple of Hindi, English films, you know, Sound of Music and stuff like that. So my, my no, education... No, in, with your adult mind. With your yes, adult mind. so my okay. education in cinema happened much later. So I missed the Bollywood phase altogether almost. Yeah. I just happened to be in the business, so I have to keep in touch with what's but happening. But no, I'm just asking you for your love list. Yeah, so, so my Bollywood <laughs> love list is very small. And at the moment, yes. I can't think of anything offhand. Uh, I have to say, I did like Bajrangi Bhaijan for whatever it's worth. But uh, that's only because if I have to choose a film... No, not that from Bollywood. From ah. world cinema, you like yeah, yeah. Iranian okay. cinema, so you like... At the moment, I'm very excited with some kinds of things that are happening in India, particularly in Marathi movies. I'm from Maharashtra, I speak Marathi, so I enjoy uh, watching Marathi movies. And at the moment, we have seem to be going through some kind of a little, um, you know, um, renaissance there. A bunch of young filmmakers, uh, some from the Film Institute, some not, but with a sharp new sensibility have come into the picture. And it's really hard because Hindi cinema, Hindi and Marathi and Gujarati and everything that I've seen before is highly loaded towards the sentimental. We love sentimental. In India, we just adore it, you know. Uh, and, and therefore, films that don't push the sentimental envelope beyond the point are really hard to find. And suddenly, there's been a spate of films in Marathi which have done that. Uh, Umesh Kulkarni is a filmmaker. If you get to see his films, and most of them are available online and on uh, Amazon and stuff like that, subtitle versions. Very exciting. Very different. I can tell you some names. They won't mean very much unless you would go back home and do a little Google search. Deul is a film he's made recently. One, some of his earlier films are Vihir and Varu. Very interesting. Nagaraj Manzure, who made uh, the super successful Sairat. Sairat. Uh, yes. And before that, a film by the name of Fandri, which was an absolutely extraordinary film. Much better than Sairat, but did not get the kind of release that Sairat did. Sairat was a huge hit in Maharashtra. There were places where they had to run the film at 2 o'clock at night, because after the 12 o'clock show got over, 9 to 12, 12 to 2, 2 to 3, I mean 2 to 5. There was a show held like that. They had to increase numbers of screens across Maharashtra. It was like a phenomenon, that film. And it is worth seeing. I'm not saying you may agree or dis... I mean, you'll make up your own mind about it, but definitely worth seeing how to handle the issue of caste in, in this manner, which is accessible to many. You know, we are, we are very ashamed about certain things. We don't like to talk about communalism. The, you know, everyone pussyfoots around it. 
एवरी वन पुसी नो बट इवन टॉक्स अबाउट कास्ट कम्युनिटिज्म के बारे में बात तो करते हैं हम लोग कम से कम कास्ट के बारे में कोई बात करने को तैयार नहीं हमारे देश में एंड दैट इज अ बिग इश्यू इट्स गोइंग टू ब्लो अप इन आर फेसिस इन अ वे दैट वी डू नॉट नो एंड वी कैन नॉट प्रिडिक्ट आई मीन सम ऑफ अस कैन एंड आर हैव बीन प्रिडिक्टिंग बट द रेस्ट ऑफ अस आर गोइंग टू बी टेकन अ बैक बाय दैट वेन इट कम्स सो दीज आर फिल्म मेकर्स टॉकिंग अबाउट इशूज लाइक दैट मसान नीरज घायवान I think that's an extraordinary film. Extraordinary. I haven't seen a film like that in India which says what it says with as much confidence and as much beauty and an emotional connect which an average audience can make. Some of them tend to intellectualize the whole thing too much. Hmm. Here's a film that gets the balance right. A a film like Aankhon Dekhi. Uh, uh Rajat Kapoor's film, last film. and the man hasn't been able to raise money to make another film this is the truth of our country that a man makes a film like aankhon dekhi which is truly an unusual film and it's worth watching all of you because it's talking about an issue that faces us but we don't want to look at it and it's not issue based it's not danda waving it's an exploration it's beautiful and you know these films just don't have distribution um Ability, you know, uh, uh, yeah. chances. So, Ratna uh, Nasir has kind of walked both paths, you know, of being part of that mainstream cinema, and he might do it crustily or he may not. But he's been a part of that. He's had one foot in that world. You've uh, been less part of that kind of mainstream. Are, but she hasn't seen Mubarakah <laughs> or Golmar. <laughs> Golmar, I have. <laughs> but what I wanted to ask you is that: Is it that they they have excluded you, or have you excluded them? I have no idea. That's the way the cookie crumbled in my case. Nobody gave me any work. I don't know. Maybe I wasn't good enough. But I think now I am, and so I'm expecting to get more work. <laughs> okay. So, um, Ratna, before I ask you some questions about how you got into cinema, just very quickly, what does theatre give you that cinema doesn't? You know, why why are you so uh so much more in the theater world and uh, does it satisfy you more than cinema shaw's words shakespeare's words ismat chokhtari's words against <laughs> sajid farhat or uh, you know who you know what i mean <laughs> so it's it's quite easy the choice the, the ideas the words the way in which I love the theater that the of the kind that we do which is a theater of ideas really it is to do with trying out and seeing the way in which the world has been looked at through many eyes i mean when you do a story by ismat chokhtai it's not just me as an actress it's not just me learning the lines and finding a way to say those lines in an interesting manner and getting talis from the audience it's it's my entry into a world that i have no other way to get into in terms of time in terms of mind in terms of all kinds of things in terms so my heart the way a story like gharwali by ismat chokhtai what it does to my soul i can't explain to you it just opens out the whole experience of living for me to look at a woman like lajo I mean if you guys haven't read that story please go back home today and read it if you can it's it's extraordinary what that woman in 1935 or something i think she wrote this no maybe 40s she wrote this story that long ago a woman who was writing in one small town in somewhere in up or rajasthan or somewhere and this is the way her mind is working this is the way she can look at human beings this is the way that she can look at the man woman relationship in a way that you and i find hard to do today what an extraordinary chance to live a life like this ratna you just spoke you know with that kind of absolute passion can you uh, recall any of the dialogues from is- isma chukta ek now you know just share with us that beauty of the words right now oh god no not now because i mean it's it's you just need to Uh, get into, uh, into the mood and apart from that if we you know, give you context, a minute if we give you a context minute. it's all context because the way she sets up a story i mean it's extraordinary it's not just great uh, 
dialogue and all that. It's it, the construction of the story, how she lets in information, the way in which she uses uh, drama. It's extraordinary what that woman does. And the humor, the humor. Man, she can just completely blow you away. She can say the most incredible thing. Uh, for example, in Gharwali, she is describing the marriage of uh, Mirza, this middle class uh, chap from some small town in UP. Who, uh, I mean, there was a small shop for Sometimes the money was so bad that they didn't have to go home and get married. And sometimes, you know, they were so busy, whatever, I've forgotten the words, there you go. You know, this is the trouble. She puts it in a way that really captures his whole life in a single sentence. And then this Nokrani comes into his life. And of course, he has the hots for her, and of course, he gets into a relationship with her. And then he asks her to marry him. And she says, Kai ko miya? 1942, a woman who has lived on the streets all her life is offered job security, life security forever, respectability, and she says, Kai ko miya? <laughs> I mean, what kind of a woman is this one? <laughs> yeah, well, we're running out of time. Uh, let me quickly see what time we're at. You know, just one question while I quickly look through the audience's questions that, you had great uh, difficulty, Ratna, entering into cinema, you know, because your mother was an actress, your sister's been an actress. Can you explain that? Why, why did that have such a psychological impact on you, you know? Okay, I'll, I'll um, it, it'll take a little bit of time. I'm not going to be able to do it in a hurry. Partly because uh, it's, it's very difficult to take up your parents' profession. I've realized that because I've been on both sides. Our, polit our politicians don't seem to have that problem at all. I was, I was in fact going to start by saying, uh, you know, maybe I have a couple of lessons to give Rahul Gandhi. But <laughs> I'm not going there, thank you very much. But really, the, the reluctance that committing yourself to something as obvious as doing what your mom did, I have to say, it, it takes some do doing. I'm seeing it now again with my children. So it is hard, it is hard. Whatever people say about nepotism, and of course it exists and in the most stupid way possible and I'm all against it and everything, I agree. But to commit to taking on a life of continuous uncertainty is hard for anyone to do. That's what my profession is. Continuous uncertainty, continuously putting yourself on the line, no safety net, no, nothing. You are out there naked and open and you're only as good as you were the last time. And therefore, to commit yourself to that. And on top of it, we have a culture that imagines that acting is lightweight work. I bought into that myself. I completely did and I'm embarrassed now when I think back on myself as a young person, but I bought into it. I thought that this is not the kind of job an educated, intelligent person like me should be doing. You know, I've, I'm th thoughtful. I'd like to be part of something really meaningful. Acting, really? I mean, come on, that's just so lightweight. It took me like 20 years to understand that becoming an actor is about the most difficult job in the world because you have to, there's nobody to teach you, first of all. Absolutely nobody, trust me, nobody. No institution, nobody. You're doing it all on your own. Fortunately for me, I had a couple of people who could give me a, a at least, you know, flat post the way for me. But it's really up to you. And it takes a lot of doing. And the waiting, the waiting can be killing. You just are constantly waiting to be given work. And, and this in India, where theater is still possible, you know, we are extraordinary. I keep saying this over and over again. Our country is extraordinary. We have an amateur theatre movement alive and kicking today. Five friends in Delhi University can get together, read a play and say, Yar, Harold Pinter karte You know? <laughs> Nowhere else in the world will you be allowed to go anywhere near Harold Pinter or near a theatre. You would have to become a member of equity, you would have to get a job, and a whole list of conditions you would need to fulfil before you can go get anywhere near Harold Pinter. But here, three guys in DU can say, Chal yaar, Harold Pinter karte 
And that's extraordinary. And in spite of that, to train yourself as an actor, it's really hard. So, I mean, it, it took me a long, long time to first admit to myself that I want really badly to act, that this work is something that can give me fulfillment throughout my life, and that I'm going to spend the next 35 years learning about it. It's taken me a long time to admit that. And that it's not a youth-based profession. An actor is an actor for a lifetime. Yeah. You're not only an actor while you look pretty and while your hair is white, uh, gray, sorry, uh, <laughs> black, sorry. <laughs> Freudian slip. <laughs> uh, Ratna, there's someone called, a member called Ratna who uh, wants to ask you that, uh, you know, what did you think of Wednesday in which Nasir acted? And when can we see you again as Mrs. Sarabhai? I love that show as the rest of India does. I have no idea about the second question. I don't know how to answer that. Uh, if there is anyone who has any contact with star television, Rupert Murdoch preferably, <laughs> please put in a word for us. We'd love to go on air again. <laughs> to answer the first one? Oh, sorry, what's about that? Nasir and Wednesday. And Wednesday, yes, it's a very effective, very powerful film. It got across to a lot of people in our country. But I have to say, I'm conflicted about the end. Yeah. I am, I'm not sure what to make of it. I felt that when I first saw it, and I still feel that. And uh, all the same, I would prefer a film like Wednesday to be made than not made, because at least it opens out a dialogue. Sorry, uh, this is an interesting question, but not, there's no member name attached to it, but what do you think of uh, the new young women actresses like uh, Kangana and Alia Bhatt? Are you needing to gulp water before you answer that? <laughs> and Sonakshi Sinha, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. And so on. There's a whole bunch of them. Some of them will hopefully <clears throat> want to push themselves. Kangana seems to be one who does want to push herself as an actress, not as a pretty face. Hopefully, Alia will discover that about herself also, that she is more than a pretty face and that she can act. But I have to say that I've worked with Alia and I've watched her on the set. And somehow, a lot of young women think that they need to be endlessly cute. And on a film set, cuteness is a killer. I can tell you, <laughs> everyone's just dying to be cute. I don't know why. But actresses, for some reason, seem to feel the need more than others. She didn't. She watched. And I'm hoping that that would stand her in good stead. Uh, she seems to want to do different things. Kangana definitely seems to want to do different things. And more power to her. She's saying stuff like nobody has ever had a chance to say. Good for her. I love it. <laughs> Um, the dirty girl is going to become a trope that we have to look out for. Um, so this is Neighbor's question that where would you rate yourself from 1 to 10 uh, on a ladder of 1 to 10 of talent? Talent? Oh well, she hasn't used the word talent but a ladder of 1 to 10. Rate myself? Yeah. My looks are 10. <laughs> My uh, figure is 10. <laughs> My... I mean, come on, I don't want to rate myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Why don't you so rate So there's a good question on television, just that... Actually, I want to answer that question. Why are we so interested in ratings? Why do I need to know if a film is worth three stars or four before I go to see it? No, why why on, this it? need for 50 things to do before I die? Why this need of 10 best films of the last 10 years or the last 10 seconds? You know, I mean, really, enough. <laughs> okay, so just one last question. We asked you nothing about the fact that you're entirely a film-based family. You know, you've been married to Nasir like 30, 40 years. Uh, your children are all into cinema. What is that family dynamic like, Ratna? Is it difficult to live and love people you're also working with? Yes, it is. No doubt it is. And it's about as difficult as living and loving people of any kind that you're <laughs> having to do. Uh, but I do feel that uh, because it's theatre, essentially that connects us rather than film, it's, um, it's, it, it has been satisfying. 
Uh, I've always believed that theatre is like a relationship, a long-term marriage, for example, whereas films are like a little affair, a fling. You go in and out of that film. It's very hard to sustain relationships within the film context, whereas in the theatre, you do plays for years. And our group does plays for years, money, years. We keep a production alive until, you know, it's dead and buried. If we can help so, it. Uh, uh, we've kept a production of Dear Liar, for example. You've been seeing pictures of that. We've kept it alive for the last 20 years now. 94, 23 years. 94 is when we opened it. So between Nasir and you, was it difficult? Did you have a period of working out the male power dynamics with the woman's power dynamics and art. I won. Yeah. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> He's not. <laughs> That's a good note to end on. And I have to say, you did win. Because before uh, Ratna came on stage, I'd called Nasir And I said, Nasir, give me some clues to her, some levers to press with Ratna. And amongst other things, I said, what has it been like being married together? And this is the most wonderfully sentimental and soft I've ever heard Nasir because he said, you know, it's amazing. She's the jewel of my life. And she has just been, it's been such a happy, happy, happy life, you know. He said he's just... Actually, that took me by surprise also. <laughs> the fact that we've had such fun. I don't know whether we deserved it or not, but we've got it. It's been really good fun. So, cheers to that. But at least in the articulation, you're one up on him because you, you were pretty tepid, but he called you the jewel of his life. <laughs> and we got a glimpse of why, Ratna. So, thank you for being here. And thank, thank you, you everybody. Thank you very much for having me.